joining me virtually from around the world is a panel of experts in this important topic. And it's especially important as we're seeing more regulatory enforcement actions happen in the ecosystem, such as the BitMEX actions that were announced yesterday by U.S. government agencies. Compliance is especially critical for virtual asset service providers, as we'll learn in the space. So let's welcome our panel. Coming to us from South Africa is Angus Brown, the CEO and one of the co-founders of Centbee. Dominic Caroso, who is founder and non-executive chairman of Banksa, and Delphine Forma, who is a board member of the Open VASP Association, coming to us from Switzerland. Hello, all. I want to ask each of you to introduce yourselves and your company, and more importantly, what role or background you have in the compliance space, in particular as it relates to your particular company. So let's start with Angus. Hi, Jimmy, and uh, welcome also to uh, Delphine and uh, Dominic. Uh, I'm very pleased to be back here uh, on uh, CoinGeek Live again. And uh, the background for, for CNP is in 2017, we created uh, CNP as a Bitcoin wallet. And uh, we spent a lot of time since then in creating, uh, working on the on-ramps and the off-ramps. How to get your money into Bitcoin and how to get your money out, how to spend it. So um, we've spent some time on that. We then in late 2019 uh, created another app, a remittance uh, application, uh, which is called Minute Money. Uh, and that is effectively moving money uh, across borders using crypto assets. And then in early this year, we launched uh, something we've been working on for quite some time, which is a merchant application to enable merchants to accept uh, Bitcoin. So with that background, um, we've had to, to spend a lot of time understanding those on-ramps and off-ramps, the connections between um, the crypto world uh, and the real world, both on-ramp, buying and selling and spending. And um, also from a remittance side of things, we've had to spend some time understanding travel rule and international money laundering, terrorist financing issues. And in the merchant uh, app, we've also had to spend some time getting closer to understanding the interface international payment systems, which are you know, very important national infrastructures. Delphine, please introduce yourself and your extensive background with compliance. Hi, Jimmy. Very happy to be part of this panel tonight. Uh, so as you said, um, I'm a board member of the Open VASP Association, and the Open VASP Association is based here in Switzerland. And we are building a protocol to comply with the travel rule, and I guess we are going to talk about that a little bit later. I'm also a board member of the Crypto Valley Association, and I just recently joined TAL as a chief compliance officer. For the background, I've been the head of compliance for Lique, which is a crypto exchange in Switzerland for three years. And before that, I work in uh, HSBC in London and Bank of Tokyo still uh, in the compliance field, mainly working on trade finance compliance. Congratulations on your new role. That's news that's hitting here at CoinGeek Live. Delphine is the new chief compliance officer for TAL. Now let's go to Dominique. Why don't you introduce yourself and explain to our audience what is Banksa and what does it do? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, so my name is uh, Dominic Croza, the founder of Banksa. Uh, we're a payment service provider uh, for the uh, for the crypto space. Uh, we've been running for uh, since 2014. And, uh, and so we provide our fiat on and off rails uh, to uh, the industry, uh, both across a number of exchanges, as well as uh, a number of websites that we own, such as bitcoin.co.uk and bitcoin.com.au. And just, I guess, from a compliance perspective, to take a step back, you know, when I first started uh, in the space, there was really no regulation. Uh, it was the Wild West, uh, so to speak. And what we've really started seeing, and, and my personal view is that regulation, even though some of the uh, purists uh, don't particularly like it, I think it's important, it's, it's here to stay, and no government around the world would basically allow crypto to flourish without regulation. And in fact, we were one of the uh, founding board members uh, in Australia. Uh, we actually lobbied the government for regulation. Uh, I know that sounds pretty crazy, a crypto company lobbying the government for regulation, but. We did that and then we uh, achieved uh, one of the first uh, licenses in Australia and in fact one of the first crypto licenses around the world. Um, we have offices in Australia, Asia and where I'm based here in Amsterdam and in fact from a compliance perspective we're just about to try and find a new compliance manager so if there's any new compliance officers please reach <laughs> out to me. 
Well, Delphine is taken now. But, um, Dominic, I th understand you have an announcement you'd like to make about Banksa and uh, Bitcoin SV. Yeah, so we've, uh, today, in fact, today we've uh, we just announced that uh, we are launching Bitcoin SV across our entire platform and our entire ecosystem. And that basically includes not only the, the Banksa platform, which is connected to many global exchanges like OKX and, and KuCoin, but also our um, Bitcoin websites like bitcoin.com.au, bitcoin.co.uk, and we've got a whole host of other Bitcoin domain names. And uh, we're actually very pleased uh, to be part of the Bitcoin SV ecosystem and uh, very much being on the panel today as well. So, yeah, thank you very much. Well, welcome to the Bitcoin SV Society. Now I want to dig into the hot compliance topic of the current time period, which is the FATF's travel rule. In a nutshell, uh, it requires virtual asset service providers to do essentially what banks do when you're collecting or having processing the sending of money. For example, that is to collect identifying information about the originator, the sender, and the receiver, the beneficiary of funds. In this case, Case for digital assets that would apply to exchanges and custodial wallets and other types of service providers. So it's not a law, but it's something that member countries that are part of the FATF are seeking to enforce. So let's talk about that. Um, Angus, do you review the tra view the travel rule as something that is good and useful to apply to the digital asset ecosystem or too strict? Well, I don't think uh, in any case it's, it's a fact. It's not an idea. It's uh, it's going to happen. It's uh, it's already in place. It just hasn't been uh, put into laws in in every country. But uh, there's a lot of a lot of very swift motion that's going on by a lot of regulators. So and we're very supportive of it. Uh, we think it's it's important. It is challenging. It's not easy. But there's one part of it I really like, and it's actually a recognition that crypto assets, Bitcoin, is money because that's what the travel rule applies to. Delphine, I know you've been working with various organizations about finding standards for compliance with the travel rule. What are your thoughts about whether it's a good idea for the digital asset industry? Well, I'm going to try to give you a very uh, um, diplomatic answer, right? I mean, like, the, I think like there is good and bad. Like, the good thing is, I think, like, if we really want to have a wider ad adoption of cryptocurrencies in, in general, we need to have compliance standards. We need to show that the crypto world is not the, the far west, that we actually have standards, that we apply policies and procedures, and that we really want to uh, comply with regulation. So, I think the travel rule, I think it's a good a good step forward, a wider adoption, especially if, if we want to have um, big institutional players like bank and all the regulated um, institution, if we want them to enter the space really and publicly, I think like this, this is absolutely key for, for the industry to have like such a standard in place. Um, but if we look at it from a pure financial crime point of view, so that's more like my field, I will say it also has it also have some danger of having the travel rule in place the way they want uh, the FAFT want it to be implemented uh, because it leaves like all the peer to peer um, uh, sector industry um, whatever you want to call it uh, out of it. So meaning if you are a criminal, what are you going to do if you're smart enough? Instead of using exchanges, you will just go to peer to peer. Um, platform which are not falling under the travel rule regulation. Well, I guess it depends on the, uh, on the jurisdiction, but for now, if you look at the FAFT guidance, it is not falling in there. And so at the present time, criminals, uh, they will still use exchanges in order to launder money. And with this new regulation in place, they will just turn to peer-to-peer -peer sector and we will lose visibility and track of their activity. So that's the danger, but let's see how that goes. <laughs> Dominic, um, what is your company's perspective on what the challenges are for the industry to comply with the travel rule? Um, is, what are the difficulties for an exchange or custodial wallet? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's multiple um, challenges in the space, and, and maybe I can just give you a bit of a sense of, of our experience. We're dealing with uh, quite a number of regulators uh, globally, 
um, each one of them, and, and what I'm, I'm going to be diplomatic and not actually name any particular regulator, but just say a number of regulators that we're dealing with, um, are interpreting those rules in very um, different ways. And I think that, you know, the travel rules here to stay, um, you know, the Sanctions Act uh, is here to stay. And I think, well, you know, all those things are important in terms of bringing further credibility and ultimately more institutional money into the sector. However, I think my, my biggest issue is um, the regulators out there are not crypto people. They don't really understand the technology and they're trying to adopt an old world or old economy system and shove it down the throat of, let's call it the, the new economy in crypto companies. And just by way of example, um, we're talking to a number of regulators around the world. They're interpreting it differently. And, and I think that ultimately is going to cause fragmentation and issues, not just for our company, but for the entire system. And my personal view would have been um, a, a bit like if you look at from a web perspective, whereby you know, there are certain rules set down and then there are groups that will build protocols that are then adopted by the entire industry. I mean, you only need to look at HTML5. I know I'm sort of putting my techie web hat on, but that's just an example where the industry got together, created effectively the, the framework and then rolled it out. And I think with that, can be it can be much more successful. And I think as uh, Delphine mentioned, what this will ultimately do is the people that are legitimate are going to continue operating within that, that ecosystem. And those that are not legitimate will either go to peer-to-peer -peer exchanges or frankly, where most of the money is actually laundered and that is using US dollars. Um, so for me, I, I think the, the fragmentation and the lack of global coordination around specific frameworks, I actually think that's the, that's the danger. And, and companies like us are really trying to scurry uh, trying to fulfil the requirements of each of the regulators. And I just wish uh, most of them would actually start talking to one another more often. Well, what the industry is going to need is standards, and ideally a universal standard for collecting and transmitting the data fields that are required to comply with the travel rule, for example, identity of sender and address, et cetera. Um, how do you think the industry can best achieve consensus on a standard and how do you think BSV might play a role in that? Angus? Sure, and I think talking to what you said earlier, um, the light of the regulations will drive out the shadows to the corners and I think that's a good thing um, because we know that the vast majority of people are doing good things and are having nothing to hide. So that, that I think is the, the fundamental principle there. Um, and it allows a regulator to look into the corners. In terms of the standards, I absolutely agree. We need standards. And I think the Travel Rule and the Bank Secrecy Act are the sticks that will um, that create the energy. Because the crypto industry is not very well known for getting together and agreeing things. So having um, this as a stick and potentially a carrot of getting there first and getting there successfully uh, is necessary to create standards. So I personally think uh, we've got some very good uh, ingredients uh, in Bitcoin, in Bitcoin SV, uh, specifically things that are recent such as PayMail and the Bit270, which allow for more than just a data standard, but also allow a handshake protocol for how information is interchanged as well. I'll leave it over to my other colleagues to maybe expand on that. Yeah, Delphine, um, you're very involved in this process. Can you give us a quick overview of the main different types of standards being proposed right now for the communication of data to satisfy the travel rule? Yeah, sure. Um, but first, if I can um, just reply to what I've been said before, I do agree that we need standards, but for me, what is the most important thing is that we need to have um, international standards that are uh, applied in the same way everywhere because right now, sorry to, ch to change the topic, but for me, like one of the uh, uh, biggest topic on the travel rule is the sunrise issue, meaning like some, reg some jurisdiction are going to apply the travel rule in their own regulation in a different way. So if you are a crypto exchange and you operate in Switzerland and then you also have operation in another country and you deal with a crypto exchange which is in another jurisdiction, like you will have a lot of different jurisdictions involved which will apply the travel rule in a different way. So it could be like uh, regarding the um, virtual asset service provider definition. It can be the threshold. Do you apply it for zero? Do you apply it for 100 USD? Do you apply it for 1,000? So that's the first thing that needs to be solved. Then from a standard point of view, 
obviously, um, you know, I'm an OpenVast board member. So um, I think with OpenVast, we have managed to um, agree on standards and we have been working uh, with uh, Access and IBMS. So IBMS is a standard for uh, the messaging or the message will look like when there are exchanges between VAS. And OpenVAS, we are building the protocol. Um, what we have been trying to do is to be as decentralized and open as possible, but with different level of checks, uh, because we know that in the US, for instance, uh, our competitor in the US will be Teresa, and they are way more centralized than us, where they are more going toward having like a kind of um, directory of all the VAS globally, Whereas we want to have a more soft approach, we don't really want to go too much into 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 details, but we will also have a level of checks. So for now, uh, OpenVAS is working, so you can actually go on our website, get a, what we call a VAN number, and uh, execute a smart contract and be part of the uh, OpenVAS uh, association and protocol. Um, I think there is also another one that is worth mentioning on the market. So you have Trisa, OpenVAS and you also have like Signa. And those three, three different um, players are protocol, right? They like define standards. And then you have like providers that will implement the, st the standards. For instance, for OpenVAS, recently, I don't know if you've seen in the news that Nota Bene just got uh, 2 million funding, and they will provide a software ready to plug in. Whereas what we do in OpenVAS, we have an open source code. So as a company, you can go on our GitHub and try to do it uh, yourself. Or you can work with one of our implementation partners. So as I know, Tabene, you have 21 ana analytics that has realized the first transaction recently. And you have also Leaky Business, uh, part of this ecosystem. Uh, if you go on our website, you will have all the information. Or you can also talk, to me, talk with me. and be happy to walk you through in more details. <laughs> Right, thank you Delphine. And in summary, there are several different now proposed standards for uh, the messaging data to be transmitted to comply with the travel rule. And on top of the proposed protocols, there are companies developing implementations to help companies actually uh, use those protocols. So let's turn to Dominique. Um, what are lessons your company is seeing from its experience trying to deal with all these compliance requirements, including with, for example, travel rule compliance uh, that you could share with other companies in our ecosystem. What are some tips? Yeah, th th this is a, um, an ongoing discussion uh, at our company. Um, I mean, we've, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're working with multiple regulators and you know, I think what we can ultimately do as a, uh, as a group as a collective is work together. And I'm a big advocate of joining, you know, appropriate associations in each of the key countries. Um, and I think um, what Delphine is, is doing uh, at OpenBaz uh, is actually a very, very good initiative. Um, and so for me, it's really going out there and, and talking to people and understanding how they're dealing with the relevant issues. And just by, by way of example, um, one of the regulators that shall remain, remain nameless um, was basically looking at how do we actually onboard a customer. Um, they were do, saying things like, well, we should have, have a video call and the customer should expose to us their wallet address um, uh, so that way we can link the wallet address with that particular customer. And on, on the, I guess, part of that discussion, I, I sort of brought up, well, do you understand that you know, a number of different wallets, a bunch of hardware wallets will dynamically create brand new addresses every time you want to use them. And it's like, and they're kind of scratching that. You can see them scratching their head thinking, hmm, we didn't really think about that. Um, and, and so this is once again, coming back to the, um, the issue in my personal view is the regulators around the world are uh, basically making up rules as they go along. Um, and it's not a coordinated effort. And I think ultimately, you know, the key message here is we as the industry have to, we must get together and build common standards and common protocols that we can then effectively distribute amongst the ecosystem. And at the same time, also lobby certain governments and regulators uh, with regards to, and when I say lobby, I think a big part of that, 50% of that is education um, and uh, I, I sometimes when I talk to regulators and I ask have you actually bought Bitcoin or Bitcoin SV or any other coin over 50% of people have not 
Um, and these are the regulators that are implementing these rules. And so for me, I think education um, as an industry, we have so much more work to do uh, because we, I guess, you know, I mean, I'll put up my hand and say, yes, I'm a geek um, and, uh, and, uh, and a nerd in that respect, but you know, the other people out in the industry are not. So uh, I think education and then the creation of standards that we can roll out on a global basis, not just a regional basis, but a global basis. Well, Dominique, you fit right in because this is Coin Geek after all. So let's turn to Angus. Angus, I know you spend quite a bit of time engaging with the regulators and government agencies in South Africa. Can you give us an idea of what are their key compliance concerns and how is Centbee uh, addressing that within its own ecosystem? Sure, and I think uh, as a business, you decide on your domicile and you know, we started off in South Africa, we are domiciled in South Africa, so we engage with the South African regulators. Um, they have put together a working group which brings through all the regulators that, have, that are involved with cryptocurrencies from the securities side to the payment system side to even the foreign exchange control groups. Uh, we've been engaging with them for a long time and I think this is one of the lessons as well, is to get out well ahead of where the industry comes currently is. Figure out what the principles are that need to be put into place and start getting onto that path quite, you know, six months, one year ahead of where the regulations are. So the regulators have actually now, um, after a lot of consultation with uh, the industry, have published a roadmap. Um, the first part that comes in is the money laundering, uh, the, the KYC components that should hit quite soon. So they, that will go to be a bill, which will bring um, all Bitcoin uh, value uh, virtual asset providers into the domain of registered financial institutions to do KYC, which gives us registration and gives us certain responsibilities. Um, after that uh, is likely to be coming the exchanges where we will be licensed to buy and sell. Um, and those are uh, requirements that are still being fleshed out. The details are being fleshed out, but the roadmap is there. Uh, and I'm quite comfortable that uh, we're already well ahead of that roadmap with putting in place all of our own uh, manuals, processes, uh, even our uh, external audits, independent audits of our processes. Um, Delphine, one common concern I hear about around the world is how is it possible for a digital currency business to comply with the laws of so many countries around the world and compliance requirements from different jurisdictions? What advice do you have to give to the companies watching this about how to deal with all of these competing jurisdictions? Uh, so I think it's a very, very complex topic. Um, I mean, look at the business I've just joined right now, you know, I mean, I'm in Zug right now where we have a company here. We have also operation in uh, Canada and Cayman Island and stuff all over, the, all over the place. In my previous company, Nick as an exchange, we were based in Switzerland. From a legal point of view, we were based in the UK and operating from the UK and we had operation all over the world, serving customers all over the world. I think what you need to focus on first is like, look at the jurisdiction where you're based. And I think that, I, I don't think I should say that, but you can still pick and choose which jurisdiction you want to be based regarding on which customer you're going to serve and which kind of product you're going to offer on your platform. And um, the thing is that there is no clear answer, there is no best practice. I will just say like, first look at your jurisdiction, check the rules and regulation, comply with that. If you onboard your customer from this jurisdiction, follow the AML rules that are applying in your jurisdiction. And then when you serve customers all over the world, you need to make sure that you're allowed to sell your product all over the world. With the new FIFT uh, guidance, it's going to be more complicated because they also said that not only you need to be registered or licensed in the country of operation, but you may also need to be registered and licensed in the, in the country where you operate, meaning like where you have customers. And in that case, you will also need to check the regulation of this country. And this is going to require hiring more compliance staff, which is good for my business, right? <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, like the best advice is really to, um, what I do is I, I subscribe to most newsletters. So, you know, you can subscribe to the newsletter for the SEC. You can subscribe to the newsletter of FINMA in Switzerland, in the UK from the FCA, and really try to get all the updates from those regulators in your mailbox and monitor it the best you can, right? Dominic, what do you think will be the new and key compliance issues of the future 
we're talking about the travel rule today, but do you see areas in which you expect more compliance attention going forward? Yes, certainly. Uh, just in terms of Delphine, I, I think you make a really good point. Um, if you're a compliance manager out there, um, I think there are in the traditional world, uh, there are going to be a whole bunch of crypto companies that are going to want to hire you, including us. Just uh, to, you know, visit the banks.com website because we actually are looking for someone based out of Europe today. Um, you know, in terms of the issues moving forward, I actually think the, if you look at the centralised exchanges, uh, the centralised payment service providers such as ourselves, uh, and in fact, I, I can um, understand where Delphine was talking about, I and mean, we have over um, half a dozen licences in train uh, or already um, approved. And I just know the headache um, that we've gone through in terms of getting those. And it's not just getting it, it's then there's a whole set of overheads required in terms of managing and maintaining that. And that's part of the, the value proposition at Banksler is that we take care of those headaches for our customers. But nevertheless, just putting that aside and answering your question, um, where I think the, the biggest challenges um, will come is the regulators, you know, knowing the regulators are going to want to understand and look at the decentralised space. Um, you know, what can they do to effectively flex their muscle in that particular part of the ecosystem? And, um, you know, if you go back, uh, this is the late, uh, late 90s. I'm not sure how many people here remember Napster, uh, which was basically a peer-to-peer a, a -peer, uh, music exchange platform which eventually got shut down and then there were a whole bunch of clones coming out that were effectively peer-to-peer -peer. Um, they flourished for five to ten years um, until the record companies uh, had a, adopted a different strategy they couldn't go and shut down the um the actual exchanges the the music exchanges um, at that particular point in time so what they did they adopted a different strategy is that they went then went and lobbied all the isps in all the key countries and basically created these blacklists. So now, as compared to, say, 20 years ago, each country basically maintains a, a blacklist of, of domains. Uh, and obviously, some of those are, are domains that you would never want to visit. But what they've also been doing is adding a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, music platforms uh, on that, so you as a consumer, obviously there's always a way around it if you're if you're you know nerdy enough. But for the vast majority of people, they're not going to be able to access those sites. So I think, just looking forward, you know they can't control the decentralised exchanges and platforms. And so what's next? They're just going to go the other way and say, okay, how if a consumer has to access it via the web? I'm basically going to have rules and regulations in each country. And I think they've already got that precedence in place. Uh, that precedence is I can, if I've got the right lobbying uh, power, I can basically add websites onto that list. Um, and obviously, you know, would that move people across the dark web? Yes, yes, of course. Um, but for the vast majority of people, they still don't know what the dark web is or how they even get there. So I think looking over the horizon, you know, I think that's going to be the, the next big challenge. And I think ultimately as an industry, it's really about trying to provide a good quality service um, for consumers. Um, and, and that's really what we're trying to do at Banksler. And, and I know, you know many of the people um, on, this, uh, on this panel are trying to do the same. Angus, last question to you. As the Bitcoin SV ecosystem is developing further, which is happening very rapidly now, what advice do you have to give to the BSV companies out there to instill a culture of compliance within their teams and for their products and services? Well, I think, uh, appreciate that. I think the first thing is exactly what we're doing here today. It's just raising awareness. Um, when you're starting a business, you're not thinking about compliance. And I've started many businesses over my life. Um, and you don't start off thinking about risk management. You start off thinking about how do I get customers and how do I make money. Then you think about operations. And then afterwards, you think about risk management. But this awareness is a necessary stage. And as the community, um, the, the Bitcoin community starts maturing, as uh, offerings become more mainstream and they start growing, um, so risk management becomes part of that. And the businesses that adopt good risk management processes are the ones that will commercially thrive. And that's what we want. We want, um, we want a regular business where Bitcoin is adopted and used uh, widely and, and, and comfortably. 
Well, that's some good points to end with. I want to thank our panelists, Angus, Delphine, and Dominique for uh, their input. And clearly, CoinGeek has turned into the Banks of Job Board today. So if you are a compliance professional out there based in Europe, Dominique's got a potential job for you to reach out to him at Banksa. Delphine, congratulations on your new position. She's off the market, Dominique, uh, for new jobs. Damn. And Angus, well, you're settled in your current job now, so stay there. <laughs>